my dear student colleagues and all the viewers who are watching this program live of facebook page and youtube channel i would like to welcome you all to our international physics webinar today is our 117 international physics webinar good evening to all here in bangladesh and a good, good, very good afternoon to all those who are watching this program live from uk so hope you are well and safe from corona pandemic we are trying to adjust with this new normal situation Today, I'd like to welcome you all to through a joint session between the Department of Physics and the Department of Physics, University of Trento, Italy, in physics. And we have with us here today, Dr. Professor Lorenzo Pravisi, sir, Nanoscience Laboratory, Department of Physics, University of Trento, Italy. And he is already connected with us. So I'd like to welcome our speaker, sir. Uh, good evening and good afternoon to your part. Thanks for accepting our invitation, sir. Thank you. And we would like to. Uh, thanks on the de Department of the Physics, Pabna University of Science and Technology for accepting our invitation, sir. Thank so you. For those, yeah. For those who are new, I'd like to uh, in inform that uh, uh, we have divided our webinar into three parts. First of all, we'd like to introduce our speaker with all of you, and then our speaker will del deliver his piece. Uh, and at the end, we have a discussion time. In that time, anybody can join with us, and you can ask questions by commenting also. So. We, can, we, have, we have already come to know the title of the students in the National Physics Web. The title is the Quantum Photonics. And our speaker is Professor Lorenzo Pavisi, sir, Nanoscience Laboratory, Department of Physics, University of Toronto. And uh, Pavisi, sir, is a professor of experimental physics at the in Department of Physics of University of Toronto, Italy. And he born on 21st of November, 1961. He received his PhD in physics in 1990 at Equally Polytechnic, Switzerland. In 1990, he became assistant professor, and uh, in 1999, he became associate professor, and in 2012, 2002, he became full professor at the University of Toronto. He leads the nanoscience laboratory, more than about 25 people, teaches several classes at the Department of Physics of the University of Toronto. He founded the research activity in semiconductor optoelectronics uh, at the University of Toronto and started several laboratories of photonics growth and advanced treatment of materials. He was the first president and founder of the IEEE Italian chapter on nanotechnology. He has directed 37 PhD students and more than 30 master thesis students. His research activity concerned the optical properties of semiconductors. Uh, during the last years, uh, he concentrated on silicon-based photonics, where he looks for the convergence between the photonics and electronics. He's interested in active photonics devices, so which can be integrated in silicon by using optical nonlinearities and modified material properties. His interest encompass also optical sensor and biosensor and solar cell. Recent development is towards integrated quantum photonics and neuroformic photonics. In silicon photonics, He's one of the worldwide recognized uh, experts. He organizes several international conferences, workshops, and schools, and is frequently invited speaker. He manages several research projects, both national and international. He is an ERC grantee. Uh, he is a frequently invited viewer, monitor, and referee for photonics projects by several grant agencies. He is an author or co-author of more than 500 papers author of several reviews, editor of more than 15 books, author of two books, and holds nine patents. He's a chief specialty editor of uh, section optics and photonics of frontiers in physics, and founding editor of the series for photonic materials and applications, a joint initiative of SPIE and Elsevier. Moreover, uh, he sits in the editorial board of the ETRI journal and of the journal Sensor Applied Sciences. Optics and Ledgers. He is the advisory board of Glass 2 Power and Civila, two Italian setup. In 2001, he was awarded the title of uh, Cavalier by the Italian President for Scientific Merit. In 2010 and 11, he was elected Distinguished Speaker of IEEE Photonics Society. He is Fellow of IEEE of uh, S uh, SPIE and uh, of the SIF. He holds and age number of 59 according to Scopus and Web Science, and of 30, uh, 773 according to Google Scholar. So you can see his Google Scholar ID. Uh, his citation is more than uh, 23,000. And uh, this is his another ID. So thanks uh, for all for our, for our preparation. Now it's time to go to our speaker. 
uh, sir thanks again uh, thanks for accepting our invitation sir it's your time sir you can start your session sir okay so then thank you very much dr uh, kumar das for the nice introduction and uh, for the opportunity to address uh, uh, this audience uh, with a talk on quantum silicon photonics so i hope that you can uh, hear me and see my presentation clearly so first of all i would like to just locate where i actually i am nowadays so uh, today i am in trento in italy so trento is a small town in the very north uh, side of italy so here you see the mediterranean sea this is italy here you have the alps and trento is really in the alps so now we are in a very snowy snow week uh, uh, um, day and uh, uh, the temperature is very cold so trento is sitting in a valley so which is the adige valley and the university is actually downtown here in trento. so then uh, uh, the university where i work in is the university of trento is one of uh, uh, the best university in italy so uh, depending on the different uh, 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 national or international rankings so we are sitting in the first uh, or in the second position uh, uh, italian wise uh, this is the website of uh, the university and i do show the this website because on the on the main page of the university there is the announcement of uh, research that uh, grant that we have achieved so it is written in Italian, but here it's written that uh, the University of Trento uh, uh, won uh, once more with the brain, because we are doing also research in brain physics. So the university is a medium-sized university, so we have more or less 70,000 students, 600 professors, and uh, 11 departments. So if you want to know more about the university, so then it's very easy. So you go to the website and then you can have a look to the uh, uh, actual data there. So let me start entering the topics of uh, my today talks. That is about the quantum silicon photon. So the first point is uh, uh, to clarify what we, what I do mean by photonics. So you know that photonic is the science of light. So essentially we use photonics, so we use, the, we use this technology to uh, generate, uh, transmit, uh, use uh, light. And uh, by using photonics, so by using light, so we can uh, uh, influence uh, very different uh, 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 technologies like uh, medicine or health, communication, information, and so on and so forth. So this is uh, 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 photonics. But what I am actually working in is integrated photonics, which is different than photonics, meaning that what we are trying to do is that to take all the different photonics components like laser, mirrors, uh, fibers, uh, detectors, and squeeze everything in a very narrow chip, uh, which is of the size of uh, a, a small coin. And the reason why we do that is because in this way, so we can decrease significantly the size of the uh, uh, different photonic devices. We can decrease the cost of the photonic devices and we can make the photonic device compatible with microelectronics. In this way, not only we get uh, a wider this, uh, uh, spreading or a wider diffusion of photonic technology, but at the very same time, we can also produce, and I will show you an example, of very efficient devices. Efficient means that they are stable. You no longer need to align carefully the different optics. You have lower noises. You lose less photo. So this is the integrated photonics. But the kind of photonics I'm doing is uh, uh, done by using silicon as a platform. And the reason why we want to go to silicon uh, by a platform is because silicon photonics, that is this technology, can leverage on the already deployed electronic technologies and so, or uh, uh, microelectronic infrastructure. And so what we can do is that we can produce the photonic devices by using the same standard silicon processing used in CMOS. 
So in this way, so we can take the advantages of the uh, CMOS or the microelectronic industry, which means that we can uh, uh, produce volume, uh, mass manufacture our devices, we can redu reduce the cost, we can uh, increase the performance of the device. And moreover, what we can get quite naturally is the merging on the very same chip so meaning on the very same devices of both the communication potentiality of photonics or so photonics with the computational speed of electronics. So we can get a photonic electronic integrated circuit on the very same chip. And uh, uh, um, to do this, uh, uh, silicon photonics is essentially following the same paradigm to success of microelectronics. So in the last year, what we did was to produce the isolated photonic building blocks, meaning waveguides, meaning micro resonator, meaning uh, laser, meaning the, the, the detector. And then uh, at the early of 2000th century of, of this uh, millennium, what we did was to integrate all those building blocks into very compact, into very small chip. And today, what we can achieve is a full integration of electronics and photonics. I will give you an example about this uh, full integration. So this example came out from a new European project. So here in Europe, so we have projects that are uh, 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 performed by several different uh, 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 group, research groups uh, spread in Europe. And this is one of these example projects. So this is IRIS, the name was IRIS. And the aim of this project was to integrate it in a silicon photonic chip, a transponder, meaning a device that is used in optical communication. And the aim of this project was to integrate it, more than 1,000 photonic components to use 2,000 electronic blocks to drive and uh, 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 this photonic component and the very hand that we integrated everything within a very small uh, 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 and compact uh, uh, array. So what we did before uh, uh, we produced uh, uh, the devices, so this is the typical size, so 300 millimeter size of a silicon uh, processed wafer, and the uh, integrated optical network was one part of this wafer. So what you see here is the wafer, and then from the uh, uh, wafer, you, you, you get the uh, 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 single photonic die, and then on the other side, what you do is that you uh, uh, produce also the electronic integrated circuit, then you bond together the electronic integrated circuit on top of the uh, uh, photonic integrated circuit, and so you get the convergence on the very same device, both of electronics as well as photonics. Once you have bonded together the two chips, what you do is that you wire those chips. And here you see the example of the photonic chip that has been wired, of the photonic chip that has been optically wired, meaning that uh, we have optical fibers that take the uh, uh, light signal into the photonic chip. And then you place everything in a very compact board. So this is the compact board, which is hosting inside the integrated electronic and photonic chips. And what you see here is that you can put everything uh, uh, on top of uh, a, a standard board and you have both op uh, optical access, here you see the fibers, as well as electronic access. So you see a microprocessor here that is used to uh, 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 drive the uh, uh, photonic uh, integrated, electronic photonic integrated chip. And so this is the state of the art of integration. But let's go back a little bit on uh, uh, electronics and try to see what is uh, 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 the forecast, what is going to be the evolution of the computational power. So what you see here is the uh, overall performance of uh, microelectronic circuit as a function of the years. And what you see here is the fact that uh, 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 as long as the year passes, you have a progress in the technology to 
uh, 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 in the microelectronic technology to decrease significantly the size of the single uh, electronic switch, which are the transistors. And you see that now we are reaching the uh, a situation where uh, uh, people are fabricated one nanometer long transistors, extremely small, only few uh, 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 silicon atoms make these transistors. And then the next step is going to be, according to this chart, is going to be a paradigmatic change in the way uh, you do computation. So no longer digital computation, but what you see here is the fact that you have either to use neuromorphic computing, so a way to compute that is inspired on how our brain is working, or you have to do a, a quantum compute. So a computation that is no longer using bit, but is using quantum bit. This is another chart that uh, uh, proposed by other groups. And uh, what you see in this other chart is essentially the same conclusion. So this year, so we are reaching the limits of the standard evolution of microelectronics. And what is next? And also here next is suggesting quantum computers as well as the use of neuromorphic uh, uh, computation. And this is what we are doing. Actually, so in my group here in, in Trento, we are working both on neuromorphic computing. So we are trying to use photonic integrated circuit in order to uh, uh, validate the uh, uh, computing schemes that are inspired by the way our brain thinks. And this is the background of, uh, uh, so this is the hardware, so it is the uh, platform to uh, 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 go on uh, uh, with uh, artificial intelligence. So if you are interested on this, so you have simply to look at the website of uh, uh, this activity. On the other side, so there is the other possibility that is used to, you, to use quantum physics in order to increase the potential, increase the performance of uh, uh, the computer. And so here you have the quantum computing. And according to the economist, so this year, the quantum computing race started. And so here, the meaning is that actually the physical platform where this quantum computer will be uh, uh, developed at the uh, uh, time today is not clear. And so there are several different approaches. So you, you can use uh, 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 superconductors. You can use like, like the uh, Google approach. So you can use photons. And this is where we are working in. Or you can use, for example, uh, uh, cold uh, uh, atoms or ions, like, for example, IBM. So you have different uh, possibility to integrate uh, this quantum computer. And uh, this is actually so the topic of uh, my today talk. So uh, what I want to show you is the use of quantum physics in order to enable new functionalities in uh, uh, silicon photons. Why now? Okay, now because uh, uh, at, the, uh, at the start of the 19th, so, uh, uh, the first quantum uh, revolution was uh, uh, started. And so we had the uh, theoretical demonstration of quantum mechanics the, uh, and at the end of the Second World War, so then the first uh, transistor based on the new understanding on how uh, 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 materials are performing, semiconductors are working. So the first transistor was proposed at the end uh, in the 1959. The first integrated circuit was demonstrated in the 60s. The first laser and the first, first diode laser was demonstrated. And in the 70s, the microprocessor were fabricated. And so those are all the uh, 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 um, fundamentals of today technology, today uh, uh, way of life. So uh, uh, laser are the device that allow uh, internet uh, and the transistor are the device that uh, allow the uh, uh, actual uh, knowledge base society. But then today, so people is thinking that uh, a new step in the quantum revolution that is called the second quantum revolution started. And here, just to see that this is a, a, a concept that is 
uh, uh, shared by uh, almost all the countries, almost all the uh, researchers uh, worldwide. Uh, here, what you see in this uh, cartoon is the investment in the quantum science and technology uh, worldwide. And what you see here is that uh, each, own, uh, uh, each, uh, each country is really investing a lot in order to push the uh, uh, quantum science and technology. You see strong investment at the European level, you see strong investment at the US level, you see strong investment at the China, Chinese and by India, by Australia, and so on and so forth. So actually you see that these investments are really spread over uh, 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 the world. So this is a very serious topic. And what is about uh, this second quantum revolution? So the idea of this second quantum revolution is to try to uh, 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 develop new science and new technology which e e are based on the fundamental properties of quantum mechanics. And uh, to be simple, I'm summarizing this by saying that what we want to use in this second quantum revolution is the uh, granularity uh, uh, um, uh, uh, properties of nature so meaning that we want to use single photons, single particles, the quantization of the electromagnetic field. On the other side, what we want to use is this quantum correlation state between uh, many particles. That is called the entanglement. And finally, the fact that the state in quantum mechanics do uh, 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 overlap and so the properties of the state superposition, which means that we will use qubits where you have not the same as with standard digital electronics where you have either a bit one or a bit zero and everything in between is an error. While in quantum computer, the use of qubit is such that you have a complete and continuous uh, 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 overlap superposition between the state one and this oh here is an error okay between state zero and state one and the qubit at the same time can take all the value between zero and one it's only when you do a measurement that you collapse the wave function and you determine the actual value but everything before measurements will leave either or um, at the same time in state zero and state one. And this is the uh, real richness of uh, uh, the uh, uh, quantum computation. So let me show you a, a first example of something that we can actually fabricate. And then you can find in consumer electronics that is using the single particle nature of and here the issue is about security. And so the aim of uh, this uh, uh, specific development is to try to increase the security of the communication. And this is a very odd topic because you know that if you do not uh, preserve the security of your communication, someone can get the information that you are transmitting. Maybe very sensitive information. And so one way to increase the security of the communication is to use cryptography. So here what you do is that you take your test, what you want to transmit, and then by using a key, you, 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 you transform your plain test in a secure test, which is a, in a cipher test. So you are using cryptography. So you are trying to hidden behind the uh, 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 transmission, what you are actually willing to transmit. And then on the receiver side, you have that the receiver, by using the same key, is able to recover the test that you have transmitted. And so here, what is very crucial, and the aim of the device that I'm going to present, is to form this key in such a way that no one can intercept or no one can guess your key. 
So here, the idea is to use quantum randomness in order to generate this key. And so the key production is essentially based on the on a sequence of random numbers and the ran, the, 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 the random randomicity of your uh, 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 numbers uh, uh, is assured by quantum physics. So let's see a, an example. So typically, if you want to have a, a, a random number, what you can do is that you can take a, to a coin and then you can toss your coin. And then you, no one can say with certitude whether the coins will be uh, head or across, one side or the other side. However, this is not actually a, a secure way to produce a random number, because if you uh, uh, use an effect that is based on uh, 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 Newtonian mechanics, if you know exactly all the initial condition, you can predict the evolution of your system. And this is the intrinsic in uh, uh, classical mechanics. If you know everything, so you can describe deterministically the evolution of your system. And, and so essentially the randomicity here is assured by the stochastic cheating. So by the influence of noise, by the fact that you, do, you are not really able to describe fully your system. On the other side, in quantum physics, you have that a very simple experiment uh, 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 such as the one where you have a photon that is reflected or transmitted by a beam splitter, produce a result that you cannot uh, uh, guess. And so you know that unless you do the measurements, the photon is at the same time, this is what quantum mechanics tell you, is at the same time on this R or on, the, on that other R of your beam splitter. So at the same time, it's transmitted and reflected. And then when you do the measurements, you know that you have 50% of probability to detect one photon here or the photon there. And what happens here is that you, you, you know exactly your uh, experimental setting, but you are not able, because of the quantum physics law, you are not able to predict with certitude whether the photon will reach this detector or that detector. So by simply using this very simple ex experiment, you can produce random numbers. And so this is, was our idea. So our idea was to use a, 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 a spontaneous emission in order to produce random numbers. So why spontaneous emission? Because if we can make a, a, a silicon LED, so then we can uh, produce a a, a, a generator of random number according to a quantum me mechanism. So this means a quantum random number generator that is cheap, compact, and CMOS compact. So here the idea was essentially based on the fact that the emission process is a Poissonian process. And then if you know that in a given interval, your photon uh, has been detected, you cannot say in which specific sub-interval the photon arrived. And so by measuring the time of arrival of the photon, you can produce this random number. So we did the experiment, so an LED, a detector, and then some electronics to treat the data, and then a way to extract uh, the uh, uh, random bit sequence from the data, and then we did the analysis of the randomness. So this is the outcome of the test, and everything was working quite well. All the statistical test of randomness was uh, essentially passed. So in this way, so what we did, so then uh, uh, we uh, started from a, a very uh, uh, big and, uh, and discrete uh, uh, setup where we have on one side a silicon LED, on the other side a silicon detector, and then progressively in the different generation of device, so we decrease is the integration. And they ever at the, at the very hand, so we had both the detector as well, the meter, integrated in a very tiny uh, uh, device. So here is the measurement board, where you have the random number generator that is extremely uh, small in a, in, a very chill, in a very tiny chip. Everything is integrated here. 
And this is very, is very, is very performant devices that actually we have also patent on this very performant device. Another company was following a very similar way uh, as we are doing, and uh, here you see the, 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 the press release of Samsung that announced that now they have integrated this quantum random number generator into their smartphone. So just to show you that the kind of device that uh, uh, by using uh, uh, quantum mechanics are nowadays developed, so they are immediately, once they are demonstrated, they are immediately transferred to the market because they are satisfying a, a, a request from the market. Here, the idea is to use this quantum random number generator in order to encrypt the data for a, a financial transaction. So, uh, Samsung is already using this. Then another property that we are using, intrinsic property of quantum physics that we are using for making uh, enabling new devices is the entanglement. So here the idea is very simple. So probably you know about the uh, Schrodinger cat. Uh, and so essentially, so this was a Gedanke, and so an ideal experiment that uh, Schrodinger uh, proposed where you have a box, inside this box you have a radiative atom as well as a cat. And then this uh, uh, atom can decay, and if the atom decays, so then a gamma ray is emitted, so you have your gamma ray detector, it detects the gamma ray, and this detection activates a, a number that breaks this ampoule where you have a, uh, what you have here, a, a prussic acid, so a, a, a Poisson uh, gas uh, that is emitted, and then the cat is breathing this gas, and then the gas is done. And so the uh, uh, radiative uh, uh, process of uh, this atom is statistically. And so if you have this radiative atom inside a box as well as the cap, by looking from outside, if the box is not open, you never know whether the cat is alive or dead. So quantum mechanics tells you that the cat is in a superposition of two states. So the cat is both alive as well as dead inside this box. So you don't know whether the cat is alive or dead unless you open the box. And uh, moreover, what you have is the fact that this cat is entangled with this atom. Entangled means that at the same time, and this is the way you write, entangled means that the, uh, uh, um, at the same time, you have that on one side, the cat is alive and the atom is not uh, decayed. And on the other side, you have that the cat is dead and the atom is decayed and the gamma ray has been emitted. And so you have that the description of what is inside the box is uh, uh, made by the entanglement, so the correlation between the state where the cat is alive and the atom uh, has decayed, as well as the, the, the cat is dead and the atom decayed. And so you have an entanglement. And now if you break the box without opening and you send the atom in one side in one corner of the room and the cat in the other corner of the room, you have that this entanglement is preserved, even though they are not local in the same position. So you have a non-local correlation between the cat and the atom. So you, this is the one very important properties of the entanglement. So the, the fact that, that this quantum correlation is preserved, even in the case where the two systems are far away, so the two photons in this case are far away. And then what happens is the fact that, that this correlation is so strong that when you measure one of the two photons in the entangled pair, so this measurement is immediately reflected on the state of the other photon. And so in this way, you can use 
this kind of entanglement to teleport the information from one side to another side without having any photon that, that uh, cross the space between the two uh, 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 photons here. So this is quantum entanglement. So what we are doing here in Trento is a very particular kind of entanglement that is called single particle entanglement. So we are trying to form this kind of correlation between not two different particles, but within the very same particle. So we are using a properties of uh, the quantum mechanics that makes that is very different from uh, uh, classical mechanics. That means that the uh, uh, proper the, the quantum mechanics is contextual. And so here what we are doing is that we are entangled together two internal degree of freedom of the same particle. And the two degree of freedom that we are using are the momentum on one side and the polarization on the other side. And so in this way, so we form a state where we have an overlap between the two degree of uh, of freedom of the particle, that is the momentum and the polarization. And we do that by using a very simple optics. So in order to write the momentum, we simply define a different path. So the photon can go there or the photon can go there. And so here you have two different directions and to each uh, one of these directions you have a, a given momentum degree of freedom. And on the other side, what we do is that we use a polarization rotator in order to control the polarization state of the foot. And doing that, so we, what we build up is an entangled, a single particle entang entangled state where the photon can be at the same time along this path here with a horizontal polarization as well as along this path there with a vertical polarization. Then we build up a very complicated uh, experimental setup. We measure the state of the photon by projecting uh, uh, this photon state on a different uh, uh, on the different basis. So one photon up with uh, an horizontal polarization, one photon up with a vertical polarization, one photon on with a vertical polarization, one photon on with horizontal polarization. And then we did a Bell inequality measurement. The Bell inequality measurement is a measurement which say that if this parameter S here that is essentially uh, linked to the result of the measurements I show you is smaller than two, so then the system is purely classical. You do not have any quantum entanglement. But if it is larger than two, so then you have an uh, entangled state. And then we did the experiment. And here is the outcome of the experiment of uh, the measurements of this S parameter as a function of the setting of the experimental setup, which is essentially as a function of the projection on the different basis states. And what you see is that in for a given setting, you have that this S parameter is larger than two. So that means that actually here we have a violation of the Bell inequality, meaning that with this condition, so we have quantum entanglement. And by the way, what is fine, what is uh, interesting in this experiment is that we achieve this quantum entanglement by using a laser, by using LED, or by using a simple halogen lamp. And the uh, important aspect here is that we are actually manipulating the single photons. And so the, the reason why we see the quantum entanglement is because we are treating, we are working with isolated single photons. Yeah. So then we use this uh, uh, quantum entanglement, so single particle entanglement, in order to make a, a random number generator with certified quantum so the idea here is very simple. So you have four detectors, and then what you see is that the temporal sequence of the clicking from the different detector. And if the detector zero V clicks, so then you give you generate a number zero zero, or if the detector one V clicks, you attribute the number one zero. 
And so now here you have a sequence of random numbers that are produced by a process that is certified as being a quantum process. So this is an example of the use of an entanglement. So here you have uh, one of my PhD students, so Nicolò Leone, that is doing this experiment. You see the table where we have set, in, set up the, the, the apparatus I show you. And what we are now doing is that we are squeezing the whole table into a very compact uh, 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 integrated photonic circuit. So the, the, the idea is to pass to a device that is one square meter in size down to a device that is only one square centimeter in size. So you decrease the uh, 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 space occupancy of the setup by uh, several order of magnitude. By the way, this is a research that is carried on within a European project, as well as within a collaboration we have uh, uh, with an uh, uh, Indian uh, researcher, both in Bangalore, Kolkata, and in Kolkata. So then, we say that we have entanglement that is very important. I will want to show you another example of this very important application of quantum, of quantum correlation for uh, uh, quantum computation. So here the idea is that to use a quantum correlated particle in order to produce a single photon source. So here you see a, a, a review paper that we wrote on the topic. So the, the, the scope of this research is to uh, use, uh, to produce a single photon source in the media infrared. So let us before uh, uh, understand uh, uh, what is the uh, 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 meaning of a single photon source. So the idea is that uh, uh, to have single photons, so isolated photons. So one way that uh, one can uh, naively think to produce a single photon is simply to attenuate the laser. So you take a laser and then you attenuate at the level where from the uh, filter only few photons exit in time. However, this is not a single photon source because if you look at the probability to have a zero state, so a state with zero photon, a one photon state, so a state with one photon, a two photon state and so on and so forth, so what you see is that this probability, so the dis this distribution of, of photons in the different state is uh, a, a, a Poissonian distribution. And so you have a very large probability to not have any photon in the state. And so this is not a single photon source, because what you want to have is that you want to have that the probability of, have of having one photon in your state is very large. And all the other uh, 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 outcomes have a very small probability. So here you want to remove completely this probability to have zero photons in the state. So the idea we have, not only us, but the idea that people is following is to use a rounded single photon. And so what, what are you doing essentially in this rounded single photon source? So you take a pair of photons correlated in time, and then you use two detectors. One detector is measuring one photon in the pair. And then this detector clicks. And so the fact that you have measured one photon in the pair announces that in the quantum circuit is entering one photon. And so this photon around the presence of the other photon in the quantum circuit. And so by doing that, what you actually do is, is that you are removing completely from this probability distribution, you remove, you remove completely the possibility to have zero photon in your state. And the reason is very simple, because the measurements around the presence of the other photon. And so the probability of having zero photon is negligible. And so in this way, so you increase significantly the probability of having one photon in that state. And so this is a single photon source that is based on the heralded mechanism. And so it's called the heralded single photon source. 
So the idea here is to produce correlated in time photon pair. And so the way we used to uh, uh, produce correlated in time photon pair is to use four wave mixing. So four wave mixing is a nonlinear process by which you have the two photons that are called the two pump photons annihilate by producing two other photons that are called the signal photon and the idler photon. And in this process, you have that energy and momentum are conserved. Energy conservation means that the, two, the sum of the energy of the two photons is equal to the sum of the energy of the two produced photons. And so you have that two times the uh, 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 frequency of the pump photons is equal to the sum of the frequency of the signal plus the frequency of the uh, idler photon. If you look at the spectrum, this is the optical power measured at the output of uh, this waveguide where the uh, uh, four-way mixing process occurs. And what you see here is that you have a strong peak that are due to the uh, pump photon. And on the side of the strong peak, very symmetric with respect to the strong peak, you have the idler peak, the idler photon, and the signal photon. And so this means that you have four waves that are mixing, so the two photon, the two pump photons and the signal and idler photon are mixed together in order to give you the idler and the signal photon. But not only the energy is conserved, but also the momentum is conserved. And momentum conservation is reflecting what is called the phase matching condition. So the phase of the photon should add up in such a way that the sum of the phase, the sum of the momentum of the pump photon minus the sum of the momentum of the signal and the photon should be equal to zero. And so this is a condition that has to be preserved in order to get an efficient forward mix. And so what we are doing is that we are using what is called intermodal four-wave mixing. So we are mixing together different modes in order to fulfill this phase matching condition. Why do we use intermodal four-wave mixing? That is very simple. So in, in any material, where you, in any waveguide or in any material where you have this uh, 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 nonlinear interaction, you have that the refractive index that uh, uh, determines the momentum of the propagating photons so the refractive index uh, uh, show a dispersion. So meaning that it has a dependence on the web map. That means that the phase matching, if you are using all the same optical mode in the waveguide, so the phase matching is strong only very near the uh, pump photon frequency. So here is a, 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 a calculation of the efficiency in the signal in, in the signal generation as a function of the wavelet actually is the idler generation as a function of the wavelet and what you see is that you have in dbs uh, so this the unit here is dbs and what you see is that efficiency is very large only when the uh, idler is generated very nearby the pump but if you move away from the pump wavelength so you see that efficiency is going down so uh, minus 40 dbs uh, extremely uh, uh, weaker generation efficiency. The situation is different. Uh, the situation is different on the other side if you are using different modes in the waveguide. And this is the reason why it is called intermodal uh, uh, for wave mixing. So you use different modes. So you see these are the shape of the propagating mode in, in, in your waveguide. So you use a mode for the pump, uh, uh, the second order mode for uh, the other Photon, and then you use uh, uh, the second order mode for the signal and the mode for the end. And what you see here is that in this case, by using the uh, modal dependence of the refractive index, what you see is that you can get a strong signal far away from the pump. And so you can generate a photon which is far away from the pump photon. And this means that you can generate a single photon far away from the pump photon which is exactly what we are looking for. And this is, can be designed quite precisely. Here you see, for example, the uh, 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 wavelength of the idler and the wavelength of the signal 
for a very same pump photon energy of uh, a wavelength of 1.55 micron as a function of the wave uh, waveguide width. And what you see is that as the wave waveguide width decreases, you see that the energy difference or the wavelength difference between the signal and the ideal photon becomes significant. So here you have a signal photon at 2 micron and the idler photon at 1.3 micron. So very far away from the pump photon 50 /50. And uh, so what we did was to make a design of a chip that was able to actually do all cheap uh, uh, intermodal four wave mixing, then I have no time to explain you uh, uh, the detail. But at the very end, so we were able to generate an either at uh, 1.26 uh, uh, micron and the uh, a signal at 2 micron. So one in the near infrared and one in the mid infrared. And here is the experiment, the output of the experiment. And what you see here is exactly what we were expecting. So the first uh, is the peak due to the idler photon. The second is the peak due to the signal photon. 2 micron, 1.3 micron, exactly where we were interested in. And now we have to demonstrate the, uh, 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 the fact that this can be used as a, a, a rounded single photon suit. And so then we perform an experiment where we have our chip that is producing the two photons. And then we are measuring one photon in the pair that is surrounding the presence of the other photon. And in order to demonstrate that here, exactly we have one photon. So we did a very simple experiment to make the signal going through a beam splitter. And then by using three detectors, we are looking for the a demonstration of the fact that uh, in the case when the two idler and signal are not delayed, so they are measured at the very same time, it can be never possible that the three detector at the same time, they do click. So we are performing a, an around that two photon coincidence measurement. So the idea is that the signal photon can either go here or there, but you can never have that the two photon at the same time clicks together. And what you see here, so this is the uh, measurements that demonstrate the anti launching properties of the single photon uh, around the sources. And here you have the output, the outcome, and you see that when the power is low enough, meaning that you do not have multi-photon emission, so you see that this second order heralded uh, co coherence uh, uh, coincidence measurements give you a number that is smaller than uh, or is very near to zero, only 0 0.2. Meaning that indeed here we are able to uh, uh, show that we have an heralded single photon. And so this is important because we were able to get a mid infrared single photon with a very high uh, uh, heralded uh, uh, detected. Uh, efficiency, everything integrated in a, in a single silicon chip. And the reason why we are doing that is because we want to do quantum sensing. So by changing the pump, uh, uh, the pump wavelength, so we can change the signal wavelength. So we use single photons. And so, for example, we can measure, we can do spectroscopy by using this single photon source in the mid infrared. And so, for example, here, so we can potentially measure uh, uh, the uh, absorption spectrum of CO2. So we can make a quantum uh, gas sensor based on this single photon source in the medium infrared. So, uh, entanglement. So another properties uh, that we are uh, uh, interesting is to uh, use this uh, single photon entangled source in order to make an uh, ideal single photon. So an, an ideal single photon is a photon that is completely independent from the other photons. Entangled photons are photons that are correlated, so they do show correlation. And uh, uh, we want to have single photons that has a very pure state. 
And so in order to do that, uh, so we have to take the entangled state and then we have to break the entanglement in order to make factorizable state. And so when we measure one of the two photons in the pair, so this is not influencing the other photon. These are the key. And uh, so since my time is going, so I want to show you simply the result. So if you are interested, so you can go to read the original paper. So here is an integrated chip, which show that actually, so we are able to make a very uh, 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 pure single photon state with a purity of 90-90%. But what is also even more important in this experiment is the fact that now, you can, by using integrated quantum photonics, you can integrate it two or three or five or 10 single photon source on the same chip. And here, what we are doing is that we are doing an experiment that proves the fact that, that those two single photon sources are indistingu indistinguishable. Meaning that you cannot distinguish whether one photon is generated by one source or whether this photon is generated by the other source. And in, in order to do that, uh, what we did was quantum interference between the two photons generated by the two different sources. And so at the end, so we demonstrated in, in, in indistinguishability larger than 90-80%. So this is what record for integrated uh, uh, single photons. And uh, so this is the uh, a very nice characteristic of this in integrated uh, uh, single photon source. And uh, 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 what are, why, why do we need a single photon? And the reason why we need single photons is because single photons are needed in quantum computation. And here you have a, 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 a press release uh, 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 which reports about a result from a, a, a Chinese researcher by, a, at the end of last year, uh, of uh, uh, 2020, that has demonstrated that actually by using photons, uh, it is really possible to get a quantum advantage with respect to standard computer. So here, uh, uh, by using this quantum computer that was named Jitsu Zhang, uh, they were able to solve in three and a half minutes, a problem that uh, by using a digital computer will take approximately, because no one has done this, uh, this uh, calculation, 2.5 billion years. Okay, so this is astonishing. It's, it's showing that the, the power of quantum computers. So in three and a half minutes, you can do a calculation that by using a standard computer, it takes you 2.5 billion years. So crazy. So here, this uh, uh, result uh, is a result by Chinese scientists. You can have a look to uh, science, which is reporting this result in, in December. And then by using photons, so there are also strong investments that are trying to uh, uh, integrate because this uh, uh, previous result here was done by using discrete optical components. So they are trying to integrate everything within a chip. So here is an announcement of a strong investment to in $250 million in uh, a startup that is trying to build a quantum computer by using integrated silicon photonics along the lines I have shown. So now it's time for me to conclude. So I hope to have shown you that silicon photonic is a good platform to integrate uh, 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 functionalities based on quantum science and technology, devices based on quantum science and technology. I hope to have convinced you that quantum silicon photonics is moving to the market. So there are products that you can buy which integrate with quantum silicon photonics. The technologies, quantum technologies, can take benefit from the dense integration, scalability, robustness, and low losses of silicon photonic circuit, as an example of the single photon source I show you. And finally, and this is the more challenging aspect for students, 
there is still a lot of new physics and new devices that are there to be discovered by using quantum photons. So I would like to acknowledge the people in my group. So here you have the website of the lab if you are interested in visiting the website and the research. And particularly the people that are working on the quantum photonics uh, uh, application side of, of the group. Here you see some reference. Uh, no, I should also acknowledge the uh, uh, founding project. So the local effort in quantum science and technology here in Trento. So the India Trento project for advanced research. European Commission through to your European projects, Epicus and QRANG, as well as the European Commission through the ERC project. And here you can see a few of the books I edit on silicon photonics, if you are interested in reference for uh, having a more in depth insight on what I have talked to you today. So thank you for your attention. I'm ready for questions. Thank you, sir, for your wonderful presentation, sir. So if you allow, we can start our discussion session, sir. So good question. So the first question is, can I apply it? Uh, double photon, uh, then how effect on this? Double photon, what, what is the meaning of double photon? So can I apply double photon, then how effect on this? Uh, on this what? <laughs> I miss uh, the, the idea. Okay, so entangled photons, so you can, uh, if double photon means uh, twin photons, so entangled photons clearly, you can apply them. And what people is using double photon is for doing QKD, so quantum key distribution. So to send the key uh, from one side to, the, to, to another side. So there are many applications of entangled photons. So this is one quantum key distribution, so quantum security quantum communication. And then the second one is computation. So the, the, the different uh, 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 computing scheme are both based on single photons as well as on entangled photons. But here the uh, aim is to increase the number of particles that are entangled. So not two photons entangled together, but many photons entangled to, together. And so in this way, so you can increase significantly the way that the uh, qubits, which are no longer called qubits, but are called three bits, so they uh, so on for uh, um, uh, uh, um, the way to increase the, the computational power. So entangle more photons together. Thank you, sir. So, so if any of our students want to work with you in your lab, so what he or he need to do for uh, getting scholarship or getting admitted in your uh, lab, you know, university? Okay. So uh, the first thing is that he, he or she has to be extremely bright. So the first thing to do is that to study hard and, and to acquire com competence. And then the second thing is to apply because uh, in Italy, so you, you, you have no uh, direct offer. So everything should be go through a call, a public call. And so you can visit the website where there is uh, the list of open position. Or what you can do is that you can uh, look to the website of the university where the open position for PhD uh, uh, studies are uh, uh, announced. Thanks, sir. The main aim of this program is to motivate and encourage our students. So we're doing this program for last six months. So I think our students are benefited by uh, the lectures of uh, the famous scientists like you. So thanks for accepting our invitation. And uh, it's, it's a very good opportunity for a student to uh, learn a lot of things from famous physicians of the world. So thanks again. And uh, bye for today. Hopefully in near future, we will arrange another webinar. And after the COVID, uh, I will definitely invite you for a uh, invite you for a face-to-face -face session uh, okay. for my students. That will be very interesting. Okay, yeah. so thank you very much, eh? and uh, uh, keep on going with this very, very, very interesting and uh, uh, nice initiative. Okay, thanks. If sir. anyone is interested to come to Italy, you can drop yeah. me an email, and then yeah, of course, of course, I'll I'll contact okay. with you. Thanks. Okay. Bye for today.